<clears throat> oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't knock the table over. <clears throat> Welcome to Jason's Macintosh Museum. I'm Jason, your host, and today we're going to kick off a new series of videos which, which I like to call common problems with Apple Macintosh computers, and more importantly, what you can do about them. Specifically, I want to look at some of the issues that I've had over the past, you know, say 15 plus years, dealing with these old Apple Macintosh computers. In terms of, getting them to work and getting them to work reliably. Because obviously as these machines are aging, some of them are of course um, upwards of 30 years old, I found that there are many issues that these machines have in terms of them failing to start, failing to boot and various other other things. And over the, over the years I've worked out solutions to a lot of those problems which some of you will probably know about, but a lot of you may not know about. So I'm hoping I can share the, these little, um, little fixes and little tips um, with all of you. So this will be a new series of videos that I'll be um, putting up because I wanted to take a break from the traditional format of focusing on one particular Macintosh model and demonstrating it because what you, you haven't seen up until this point is all the work that's gone into actually getting these old Macintosh computers to run as well as they do in the videos. So I thought it was a good opportunity uh, to go behind the scenes in that sense and talk about some of the problems I've had to fix on these old Macs when I've acquired them. Because one thing that I'm sure a lot of you will know is that if you acquire an old computer, any old computer, whether it's a Macintosh or something else, the chances of it working out of the box, or not out of the box, but the chances of it working as soon as you get it are fairly slim. Um, you may have to deal with anything from a fault with a power supply to a fault with a hard disk to a fault with the logic board or a fault with the memory. There can be all sorts of problems you'll encounter, but I've found that there are certain issues that crop up again and again on these old Apple Macintosh computers, some of which are actually quite easy to fix. So I'm going to be putting together a series of videos explaining each of those and more importantly what you can do to fix these problems. So the first video I want to do in this series um, is entitled Bad Capacitors. Now <laughs> any of you who've worked around these old Apple Macintosh computers will probably know exactly what I'm talking about but this is to me the number one most common problem that you will encounter when dealing with these old Apple Macintosh computers. So, what is a capacitor? Well, for, in case you're not aware of what a capacitor is, a capacitor is an electronic device whose job is to store a charge of electricity within a circuit and then release that charge when required. So you could actually look at it as a, a very low capacity rechargeable battery, in fact, although it's the amount of charge it can provide is much lower than a battery normally can. And they're normally used in electronic circuits mainly to smooth out voltage fluctuations on a particular part of a circuit. Now there are several different types of capacitors. They all do the same job but they have different internal construction. And the type of capacitor that was used on the old Apple Macintosh models, um, which, was at, which was and still is quite common, is known as the electrolytic capacitor. And it's called that because it consists of a small metal um, cylinder or can usually that contains a electrolyte a bit like a conventional battery and because of the electrolyte inside the capacitor it's able to store an electric charge just like a battery does but unfortunately electrolytic capacitors do have some problems especially when they age which is the case with these old Apple Macs in that often over time they will simply fail. In other words, they will go more or less open circuit and will not hold a charge. And when that happens, the circuit in which they're placed will often malfunction. But 
Electrolytics have a more serious problem, some do anyhow, in that over time they may start to leak their electrolyte out. And because the electrolyte is both corrosive and conductive, if it leaks onto the circuit board, it can cause some major problems. Specifically, what can happen is that the electrolyte can A, short out a lot of the circuit traces around the board, and it can also start to corrode and eat away at some of the circuit traces. Obviously, that's a bad thing on a logic board. So the next question is, well, how do you know if your capacitors on your Apple Macintosh are bad? Well, bad capacitors, because they're um, an essential part of any um, electronic circuit, you it can cause all sorts of unpredictable behavior. But in my experience, the number one symptom of a Macintosh with bad capacitors is that you will turn on the power, the Macintosh, the power supply will, will start up, the fan will start spinning, but it will not chime and you will have no video and the system will not boot. Power is getting to the logic board, but the logic board itself isn't actually starting up. And that's usually because the capacitors on the logic boards, at least one of the capacitors on the Apple Macintosh logic boards, is responsible for holding the CPU in a reset state until the voltage level stabilizes on the board after you turn the power supply on. It's then meant to take the, the CPU out of its reset state and then it can start to boot. When the capacitors go bad, it, that never happens. In other words, the CPU never gets out of its reset state and the system doesn't boot up. So that is one um, symptom. Another symptom you may find is a machine that will boot and work perfectly fine except you have no sound. And that will often happen if the audio output capacitors on the board fail and you simply have no, no audio, no, no, no chime, nothing, whether you're using the internal speaker or an external speaker. And if you have capacitors in general that are just starting to fail, then you may find you have a system that will chime and will boot normally, but every so often it will either lock up or reset or give you a, a, um, a system error of some kind. General instability. And that's a consequence of the capacitors failing to maintain a constant voltage level to all the circuits in the board. So you know, there, there, are, there are many, many um, possible issues that bad capacitors can cause. And as a result, whenever I acquire an, an old Apple Macintosh, I will almost always replace all of the capacitors if the system is working normally because I know that they will fail at some point. But it's important to stress that some Macintosh models are more susceptible to this than others, and I'll explain that now. Apple basically used two main types of electrolytic capacitor on their logic boards, starting with the original Macintosh from 1984 all the way through until um, the, well, the most recent Mac that I have, which was from the early 2000s. And from 1984 up until around 1987, they used the what's known as the axial type electrolytic capacitor, um, which was used in all machines they built up until 1987. And that includes this machine here, which is a Macintosh SE. Now, what happened in around 1987 is that Apple started changing the way they built their logic boards. They went from the old style of through hole mounting for components where the component pins go straight through the logic board and are soldered on the other side. They then switched from that to the newer surface mount system whereby components are mounted on the top of the logic board and are soldered onto the top of the board and then the traces go out from there. Now as a result of moving to surface mount technology, Apple needed to change the type of capacitor that they used on their logic boards and that's when the trouble started. These two machines are good examples. This Macintosh SE has a logic board that uses through hole mounting technology and it has capacitors which generally don't have an issue. They don't fail and they don't leak. But this newer Macintosh, this LC3 from around 1994, has a surface mount logic board and it does have the capacitors that are surface mount and they're the ones that are problematic 
they fail, and they leak. So what I'll do now is I'll show you the logic boards for each of these two machines so you can identify the differences. Okay, what we have here is the logic board out of the Macintosh SE that was built around 1987. And you can see that the capacitors on this board are the old axial type. As you can see here, there's one right there, there's one there, and there's a few more over here. And so because this board is a through mount board, these are the capacitors that generally don't have an issue. As you can see, there's no evidence of any leakage and this board still works perfectly well. In fact, if I turn it around, you can see that it's all through mount. In other words, all the components have their pins going straight through the board and they're soldered on the bottom, as you can see. So, basically every model of Macintosh, at least that I'm aware of, built up until around 1987, has this style of capacitor. So now I'll show you the LC3 logic board, which has the newer surface mount style. Okay, well here is a logic board from the Macintosh LC3, and notice that all the components, well most of them anyway, are using surface mount. For example, the glue logic chip right there, the SCSI controller there, most of the other chips, they are mounted on the surface of the board, and their pins do not go all the way through. And notice as well, the capacitors are different. The capacitors are little silver cans, you can see there's one there, there's one there, uh, there's three more down there. Now these are the type of capacitors that have a problem. Basically, these, over time, will start to, first of all, lose their ability to hold the charge, which affects the operation of the circuit in which they're placed. But more importantly, they will start to leak their electrolyte and it will start to ooze out onto the surrounding traces around the capacitor, which of course will initially make the machine simply not function because it will start to short out a lot of the traces. But if left for too long, that electrolyte will start to corrode the traces away. Now this particular LC3 has capacitors which are just starting to fail. Um, and I'll explain that um, in a moment. But what I'm going to do in the next video is actually go through the procedure for changing these capacitors, at least the way that I do it. So hopefully if you have a Macintosh that has um, issues with bad capacitors, you can do all that work yourself. And just to note, if I flip the board over, you can see that most of the components don't have pins going all the way through. Some of them do, like this, the, the expansion card slot and the ROM chip um, sockets. But most of the other components, as you can see, don't have pins going all the way through. You can see there's also a lot of service mount components on the back of the board. But generally the capacitors are only mounted on the top side of the board, not on the bottom. Okay, so now that you've seen the differences between the two styles of logic board, I should go over some of the details on which models have which type. Because even though the cutover between through mount and surface mount boards was around 1987, some models that were developed before that time continued to be produced after 1987 with the old style boards. So basically if you have a Macintosh um, 128K, 512K, 512KE plus or SE or SE SuperDrive, they were never produced with surface mount boards. So the capacitors on those generally don't give any problem. Although of course if they do start to leak you should always change them. But I personally have not seen any of those machines with bad capacitors. I've seen bad capacitors in the power supply, so but that's a different issue. I'm talking about capacitors on the logic board. So from that point on, the machines use surface mount boards. And the first ones that I know of um, were the Macintosh 2X um, in 1988. Because the original Macintosh 2 did not use surface mount capacitors. Um, but the 2X did. The 2X 
um, and the other members of the Macintosh 2 family, such as the 2CI, um, 2FX, 2SI, they all had surface mount capacitors. And really from about 1988, 89 onwards, that was it. Every Macintosh made from that point on used the surface mount capacitors. So um, certainly once you get into the 1990s, you can be 100% certain that you will have those bad capacitors. And they kept using them right through the 1990s on the Power Macintosh models and, and so on. But basically, if you see those little round silver tin cans on the surface of the logic board, watch out. Those are the capacitors that can fail. So, back to this Macintosh LC3. Now, this LC3, as I mentioned, has capacitors which are just starting to fail. And the reason I know that is because if the machine has been sitting for more than a couple of days, and I then turn it on, there can be up to a two minute delay between turning the power on and hearing the startup chime. And it's during that period of time that the bad capacitors are slowly charging up to the point where they can pull the CPU out of its reset mode and allow the system to boot. Once the system is running, it runs fine. And if I then turn it off and leave it for five to 10 minutes and turn it back on, it will chime almost immediately. But the fact that you have that delay between power on and the startup chime indicates a problem with capacitors. So in the next video, I'm going to basically show you how you can change the capacitors, these surface mount capacitors on your Macintosh logic board and replace them with um, standard, um, not axial, but the, uh, but the standard um, electrolytics um, and basically get your old Macintosh working again, hopefully, as long as the, the um, traces haven't been eaten away. So, I hope you enjoyed the video. So, thank you for watching and stay tuned for part two, which will be the replacement of the electrolytic capacitors in this Macintosh LC3. Nah, nah. <clears throat> and today, we're going to take a little bit of a. No, not a break. Um, what's the word? Um, the. I've seen quite a few um, issues with them relating from, um, uh, it doesn't make sense. They're an electronic component that can actually store, uh, ugh, no, 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 no. Do I need to explain that? Uh, cut. They're called that because they consist of a small metal, uh, no, 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 that's. Now, just like any computer, the old Apple Macintosh model will, in fact, any Mac... No. Ugh. Think about what you want to say. Because of the electrolyte um, functioning that... Cut. Uses the old style. I can't zoom in any further. <laughs> You'll see that because this board doesn't use any surface mount... Focus. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, basically, the original Macintosh was in a Macintosh LC3 from a, no, 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 think about it. Think about this.